So welcome everybody to uh, this latest Japan House uh, London event online. Uh, my name is Simon Wright and I'm the Director of Programming here at Japan House London and today we have a what proves to be a very special talk I think called Dig Dogs, the Archaeology of Dogs in Japan with Professor Simon Kainer. Uh, this uh, is in association with our Architecture for Dogs exhibition uh, that we have at uh, Japan House London at the moment. And this today's talk uh, looks at a different side. It's not architecture as such, um, but looks at how dogs and the relationship uh, with their human companions um, can be looked at throughout the ages in, in Japan. Uh, Professor Simon Kainer, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we're very, very happy to have you. Um, I can see that this is going to be very entertaining. I'm looking forward to it immensely. You are the uh, Executive Director of the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures in Norwich, and you're also the head of the Centre for Archaeology and Heritage, and the Director of the Centre for Japanese Studies at the University of East Anglia. Um, for those of you who may not know Simon, uh, he has curated the exhibition The Power of Dogu at the British Museum. That was that was a few years ago now, wasn't it? And your recent publications include an illustrated companion to Japanese archaeology and the archaeology of medieval towns, case studies from Japan and Europe, both of which are available from Archaeo Press of Oxford. I see here that one of your pandemic projects is the online Jomon Matsuri. I, my, I'm, 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 please do tell us about that a little bit later. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this talk, Simon. I will um, just tell our, our people what, uh, who are watching what will happen. We have a few housekeeping rules um, and, and, and uh, ideas for you. The, your microphone and your webcam, if you're joining us, will be disabled for the entire duration of the event. But if you'd like to ask questions and there will be an opportunity at the end to ask Simon questions, please use the question and answer feature uh, at the bottom um, of the screen and type your questions. These will be moderated by a member of the Japan House team. Um, you can send them anonymously or you can send them with your name. Uh, we will have 15 minutes, as I said, at the end. And please note that this event is being recorded and is also streaming live on YouTube and Facebook, where the recording will be archived later. So without further ado, Simon, let me uh, hand over to you and we will, I will see you at the other end of, this, of, of, of your talk um, where we take some questions. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you, Simon. And um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, what a pleasure it is to be with you all on this rather dark and damp East Anglian evening for me. Um, and I hope that over the next 40 minutes or so, I can lift spirits a little bit with, um, with a little bit of an excursion into the world of uh, Japanese archaeological dogs. Um, it's a topic that I've greatly enjoyed um, researching. I've always had a bit of an interest in this, having we've been a family of, of, of dog keepers over the year, although we're in over the years, although we're in a bit of a lull in that at the moment. Um, and um, I'm going to take us through some examples of, of Japanese, Japanese archaeological dogs, if you like, um, and then set them in a little bit of context for you with, um, with some recent discoveries in other parts of the world um, as well. But um, let's, uh, let's just kick off with, uh, with, with a little dedication to start with. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm a very kind introduction from Simon pointed out, I'm an archaeologist by training, and I've been very lucky to spend most of my career working with Japanese archaeologists. Um, and one very special one was Professor Matsui Akira, um, who was the um, head of the Center for Archaeological Operations at the NARA National Research Institute for Cultural Properties in NARA um, for a number of years um, before his retirement. 
And um, it was Matsui Sensei who really got me interested in what animals can tell us um, about what it means to be human and how animals helped us along that evolutionary pathway. Now, Matsui Sensei was the doyen of um, zoo archaeologists, as we call them in my field um, in Japan, not people who study the archaeology of zoos, but um, the people that study the archaeology of zoology, I suppose, or animal bone archaeology in particular. Um, and this is his um, wonderful book, The Fundamentals of Zoo Archaeology in Japan, uh, that came out in 2007 from Kyoto University Press. And it really brought together a uh, an amazingly productive career's worth of studies of animal bones and as I say what they can tell us about what it means not just to be animals but what it really means to be to be human that in many ways is the archaeological endeavor uh, to try and work out how we've how we've got to where we are today and maybe even a little bit about where we're going um, this in the bathtub here looking a bit sorry for himself is, is Matsui Sensei's dog Lucas uh, Matsui Sensei was a great dog lover, um, and he had two of these wonderful Labradors who he had, him and his wife Miyuki, who very kindly provided um, this uh, this lovely photograph for me. They they were they are failed guide dogs, and um, they they travelled very large distances to to gather up these dogs, and then they got a very warm home in the Matsui household. And here is Lucas having a bath, which is not normal dog behaviour, um, I believe, but I thought in the absence of photographs of onsen and other things that would really cheer us on a cold winter evening um, this would be a, a place to start and I was thinking given that the the title of the wonderful exhibition at Japan House at the moment is architecture for dogs um, I'm not quite sure to what extent there are dog onsen in Japan but surely there's an opening in the market there if there aren't yet. Now today I believe there are possibly a billion dogs, um, canis familiaris, domesticated dogs, scattered across the world. And here they are, the dogs of all nations. And um, we know, you know, if you think about the, the, the British bulldog, um, or if you think about the, um, the Japanese, uh, the Chiba and the Akita, the dogs, certainly since the 19th century, have become very associated with national identity. And uh, that, for me, it makes them a very um, reasonable uh, object of study for an archaeologist who's interested in the way that human societies have developed over time, in the way that symbolism has developed over time, and the sort of this whole history of, of human animal relations and how that has helped us um, become the human beings that we are today. Um, and in these days of, uh, in the social sciences of post, what is described as post-humanism, um, understanding human beings' place in the world is obviously absolutely essential to um, understanding the decisions that we need to make now to inform our future. So a billion dogs out there. Um, they've had a closer relationship with human beings over a longer period of time than any other animal Cat lovers, apologies to you, but dogs win out in the domestication stakes. They're all descended from the European grey wolf, sorry, the Eurasian grey wolf, the Canis lupus, um, and we're going to meet uh, some of those. I've got one just whispering in my ear, actually, which is a, a recent addition to archaeological discoveries. This one is 40,000 years old and um, was reported in June 2019, having been discovered in the Siberian tundra, um, complete with brain. It was just the head that was discovered, unfortunately, as is so often the way with, uh, we get parts of these big paleo animals that, 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 that roamed the Ice Age world, but the head was 40 centimeters long in its own right. And that makes it half as long as the whole body of a modern wolf. So a phenomenal sort of creature there. And anyway, these are, these, if you like, are the, the Ur wolves. These are the, the ancestral figures. We know that uh, dogs, um, Canis familiaris, domesticated dogs, were probably domesticated between about 20 and 15,000 years ago. So there's a very long, what we like to describe as a very deep history um, between um, dogs and human beings. 
Uh, we don't quite know exactly where they were domesticated. Um, there may be multiple points of domestication. There's been a huge amount of scientific work with DNA analysis trying to work out um, who was very closely related to. And we'll touch on that a little tiny bit in the course of the next little while. But I wanted just to start out with this. I was reading a rather wonderful paper by a lady called Naomi Sykes and a multitude of colleagues, um, too, too numerous to name, um, in a rather wonderful journal called Animals, which I hadn't realized was out there, my mea culpa. Um, and they, they have been developing a dog-centric, rather than a human-centric, but a dog-centric approach to these incredibly important United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Um, which have been put forward in recent years and to which many of us working to various agendas are aware of. Um, and dogs play a particularly important part in environmental impact. Uh, they've had their impact on the planet, as have human beings, health and well-being and, and other elements of this as well. I'll come back to that um, a little later in, in my talk. I thought I just wanted to situate us in, in the world of contemporary uh, interdisciplinary scholarship before we really get underway with our story about the archaeology of dogs in Japan, which is, of course, our, our main theme. Now, this gentleman, was well, splendid, 1877, this is Edward Sylvester Morse. Uh, some of you who know about Japan may well know his famous book, Japan Day by Day, and others of you may know also that he was the first professor of um, biology at the University of Tokyo. Um, which had opened just the year before his arrival in Japan. Um, he was a great proponent of Charles Darwin and his theories of evolution. And Morse thought that he would be able to, just in the way that Darwin was interested in small creatures like beetles and earthworms, and thought it would be easiest to prove theories of evolution by looking at the lower order animals like that. Um, Morse's passion was shells, shells of shellfish. And so he was delighted when he arrived um, in Japan in 1876. And he took the train, a British built steam train, I believe, which then ran from Yokohama, the, uh, the foreign port of Yokohama, into Shimbashi Station. And in fact, if you go to Shimbashi Station in Tokyo today, you can peer underneath the platform and you can see what the original Meiji period platform looks like. And there's a lovely steam train that stands out in the in the uh, in the square just on the north side of Shimbashi Station. But anyway, um, Morse took that train and it didn't go very fast. It wasn't quite like the Shinkansen today. And um, as he was trundling through the countryside, through the Kanto countryside, he was passing through these white deposits, um, which were in the cuttings of the new railway. And he realized that this is what we call a shell midden. It's a pile of shells, a great big heap of shells. And he knew from his previous experience in the States that these shells may well be archeological sites. And he took some of his students back in 1877 and they undertook what is widely regarded as the first proper archaeological excavation in the Japanese archipelago, Shell Middens of Omori. And he published the report um, two years later in both English and Japanese. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that report. It's a very important document. It's the first archaeological report from Japan uh, this year, as, of, as for the last 50 years, there are tens of thousands of these reports produced every year now, but this was the very first one. And in that report and his subsequent publications, he talked about some of the bones that he had found in his excavations. And he had found some human bones associated, it so happens, with some early pottery decorated with cord marks, which we call Jormon, which is where the Japanese prehistoric period, the Jormon period, gets its name from. And he looked at these bones and he was pretty canny was more so he thought he could see chewing marks on these human bones and he decided this was evidence for cannibalism which was further evidence for how primitive these early aboriginal inhabitants of the Japanese archipelago must have been. Recent work by zoo archaeologists has suggested that those gnaw marks on the bones that he found weren't actually human teeth but they were dog teeth so that turned the whole notion of Jomon people being primitive cannibals on its head. And today, the Jomon populations of Japan are recognized to be a very advanced and developed um, set of societies um, with their own highly developed cultural manifestations, which we're going to have a look at um, in a little bit. 
Now, the most important, or well, one of the most important uh, innovations that took place in the Japanese archipelago very early on, about 16,000 years ago, was the invention of pottery. And here we've got a site called Odai Yamamoto, right up in the north of Honshu, where radiocarbon dates have got some of the very earliest pottery dates. Um, and these are the little tiny fragments here. Um, and um, you can see that on the black inside, there's these what we call these food crusts. And they've been used to date these pottery sherds. And there's been some very clever science done um, by colleagues who work on these food crusts um, to suggest that what was actually being boiled up in these pots was fish soup. So this is possibly the first evidence that we've got anywhere in the world for fish soup, which was entirely appropriate given how important uh, fish dashi is in later Japanese cuisine. And we'll talk about fish and dogs a little bit more. But I want to introduce you to what is probably the main site that I want to think about this afternoon, which is called Kamikuroiwa. Now, back in 2016, I was very fortunate to be able to visit this site. It's what we call a rock shelter. It's a kind of half a cave, if you like. Um, I was invited to go visit it. It's in Shikoku, right in Ehime Prefecture. Those that you know Japan know that Ehime is right as far away from anywhere as you can get um, in Shikoku. And it was a stinky hot day, and I was taken there by Professor Harunari Hideji, um, who um, was formerly one at the National Museum of Japanese History. And I borrowed extensively from Professor Harunari's work um, and his that and his colleagues um, for what I'm going to show you now. Now, Kamikuroyo was excavated back in 1962, and I'm pleased about that, it's the year I was born. And um, they discovered a load of stuff, including bones from 28 human beings, different human beings, some rather wonderful engraved stones, and you can see one of them just down here, and you can see just a little, it's just a little pebble, which is just a few centimeters tall, little green stone pebble, um, with possible lines which are thought to represent hair, and it's thought also to be wearing the representation of a grass skirt. Who knows? Um, early German fashions, if you like. And for the purposes of this afternoon's talk, there were the remains of two dogs. And these were considered to be the oldest dog remains from Japan. And this site dates to just a little tiny bit after those earliest pottery fragments from up in Japan. It's probably around about 14,000, maybe 15,000 years old. And this would be right at the time, if you remember what I said about dog domestication happening between 20 and 15,000 years ago, these would be some of the earliest domesticated dogs that we know about. Now, unfortunately, these dog bones were lost as happens every now and then with archaeological discoveries, and they were only rediscovered in 2011, and just happened to coincide with the plans to re-excavate the Kamikuroiwa rock shelter. So here we are. Um, this is where it is. Um, I'm taking these illustrations from a publication, a rather wonderful publication available online by uh, Sato Takao, who was involved in the reinvestigation at Kamikuroi. You can see where it is now. You can see that it really is sort of in the uh, in the deep mountains um, of Shikoku. And this is what the plan looked like. Now the rock shelter is about 25, 30 meters above um, the current Kuma River in, um, in, on the, the slopes of the mountains, as I say. And um, what you've got here in the section on the right, you can see where the dog burials came from. Um, and you can see how the rock worked and it's kind of in the, in the mouth, if you like, of this rock shelter. Of course, these kind of locations were very, very highly valued by people who were hunting a lot of their food. And we think that these dogs may well have played a role in that Jomon hunting. Now, Kamikuroiwa is interesting as well, because amongst those 28 human remains, sets of human remains that were found, was this. This is a, um, a lady, a female um, pelvic bone. And as you can see, it's got a bamboo spear stuck in it. Uh, sorry, a bone spear stuck in it. Um, and this is perhaps one of the very first uh, hunting accidents that we've got good evidence for um, in the Japanese archaeological record. Two dog burials, as I say. One a large was reported as one larger dog and one smaller dog. And this is what it looked like um, while it was being excavated. Now the scrap of paper on the uh, right has written on it um, in Japanese, inu no, I think it's inu no inu actually. So these are, these are dog bones. Um, and these was the scrap of paper in which the dog bones were partly wrapped. Um, and rediscovered in 2011 in the stores at Keio University 
um, in Tokyo. And on the left, you can see the remains of these two dog bones, um, these two dogs. Um, and we think these would probably be about the size as your average um, Japanese dogs these days. So round about 35, 45 centimeters in height, not huge, but very effective probably for hunting. They did some radiocarbon dating um, on the bone fragments, and there's some new, nice new techniques that get used these days, what we call AMS dating or accelerated mass spectrometry dating, which give very precise dates for these dog bones. Now, we knew from other dates that have been got from the Kamikodoiwa site that the human bones and many of the other deposits there dated to about 12, 13,000 years ago. These bones come in a little bit later than that. They come in around about 7,500, 7,300 years ago. So these are a little later than the original bones. So we're not quite sure. Uh, this is right at the beginning of dog domestication in Japan, but they are still the oldest dated dog burials that we have from the archipelago. Now, as I say, the um, all dogs, all of the domestic dogs that we know about today are descended from the wolf the Eurasian grey wolf. And here's a Japanese example. So here's Canis lupus, as I say, domesticated about 20 to 15,000 years ago in the late stages of the last ice age. And here is a skull of one of these um, wolves from um, a site in northern Japan. Now, the Jomon period lasts a very long time. It's a bit of a headache for archaeologists. We like to have slightly shorter periods of time to deal with sometimes, but the Jomon lasts are getting on for 13,000 years. It's divided up into lots of different periods, but we know that dogs were important throughout. And here is a nice reconstructed scene from the Niigata Prefectural Museum of History in Nagaoka. If you ever get the chance to go do go, they have the best dioramas uh, that really, these are all life-size models that really bring uh, Japanese prehistory to life. And here we've got an exciting scene where we've got some dogs, two dogs, um, and they've obviously been helping with the hunt. Um, and here we've got a little sort of group, a Jomon, a Jomon household group, uh, different ages, different genders, all involved in chasing after deer. Um, for the most part. Now, dogs as hunting tools. So that seems to be the message of what we find in this Jomon period, when people are largely uh, surviving on uh, wild plants and animals. So and this is uh, dogs as what we call animal biotechnology, if you like. Um, I've borrowed this term from Angela Perry, who has undertaken, of the University of Durham, who has undertaken extensive studies of Jomon period dog burials. She's studied over a hundred of them up and down Japan. She she reckons that dogs could have been used for the following tasks, locating, showing where the prey was, so chasing after them, barking, pointing at them with their noses, presumably rather than their paws, restricting the movement of prey animals, chasing after them, recovering them, bringing them back, and sometimes, even on occasion, procuring them, so, uh, so, so looking them out in the first place. And the archaeological evidence that we might expect to find around dogs um, would be some shelters and pits, the places where the dogs are prehistoric kennels, if you like, or uh, maybe some prehistoric uh, architecture for dogs. Um, there we find equipment associated with dogs, big collars and leashes and things. We find depictions of dogs in art. We know that dogs are buried, and this is very interesting. We know that maybe domesticated dogs, hunting dogs, might have particular types of injuries and diseases. And we can also, using some scientific methods, pick up variations in diet that we might not see um, with, um, with their wild um, ancestors, and also the kind of prey profiles. What this means is when we look at other animal bones on sites, um, we can work out which what the sort of uh, assemblies might have looked like if dogs had been involved. And just on the right, just as a bit of comparative example for you, we've got the oldest known dog burial from anywhere in the world, from Israel, from Ain Malaha, about 14,000 years ago, dog buried with this lady here in that crouch position. And in the course of this afternoon, I want to talk about how dogs in the Jomon period go from being animal biotechnology to food, to pets, and eventually to archaeologists themselves. And we'll see if you agree with me by the time we finish off. So a little bit of archaeology for you. I'm just going to zip through these quite fast. Here we've got Jomon dog burials in storage pits. These are sections and plans of these flask-shaped pits, um, which have dog, got dog bones in them. And we think, you can see it says Inu there, one, two, and three. Um, and we think these are perhaps where dogs have ended up um, at the end of their days. Some of them are more formally buried than others. Sometimes they're actually curled up 
um, and they've been placed relatively carefully. Sometimes there's more than one dog that we find in a burial pit, as we see on the right here. Um, and sometimes they've got their own pit. So is this is a this is a drawing of a little sort of pit house. Maybe this is a dog shelter. Maybe this is the first excavation of a dog house um, from the archipelago. Who knows? We sometimes find dogs buried in cemeteries because people are often buried in cemeteries, even in the Jomon period, formal burial happening from very early on. And all what you can see here are the um, where the arrows are drawn on the plans. That's dog burials from a couple of these larger Jomon period cemetery sites. We've even got doggy footprints. I was very excited to discover this one, Hirakata, Shiga Prefecture near Lake Biwa. Um, what you can see here is the arrows are pointing to little dots on these plans. These are dog footprints, and the bigger ones are people's footprints. I think that's rather splendid. Now, we know that Jomon people, although they were foragers, they lived, they weren't farmers, they lived largely on the uh, what they could find in the natural environment around themselves, but they had a very highly developed spiritual culture. And Simon very kindly mentioned the power of Dogu exhibition that we put on at the British Museum, oh, a decade ago now, I can't believe it's that long. Um, but these are just some of the examples of Jomon ceramic figures. And in amongst the 20,000 or so dogu figures that are known from around Japan, we've got a small number, not a large number, but a small number of doggy dogu. And here they are. And perhaps the most famous one is this one at the top up here from the uh, Fujioka Jinja site in Saitama, in, sorry, in Tochigi Prefecture towards the end of the Jomon period. This little figure, which is only about seven, eight centimeters long, was discovered with three wild boar. And you can see it's got its mouth open. It looks like it's barking at those wild boar. Who knows, maybe involved in a boar hunt. So those dogs have a role in the Jomon spiritual culture, but they're also, bits of dogs are also used for ornamentation and decoration. And here we've got some dog bones, which have been discovered from sites, very largely these shell midden sites. And you can see the decorations on these bones. So maybe they're some kind of uh, ceremonial maces or what have you going on there. And we've also got dog teeth, which are used, you can see these are some pierced dog teeth going on here, um, which are used as beads. And we know that Jomon people were very hot on personal ornamentation. Uh, they probably tattooed them themselves, they filed their teeth, um, they wore clothes, they liked bright colours, and they made necklaces and all kinds of bangles and things for themselves using the materials that were available to them, including dog's teeth. Okay, that was Jomon hunters. What happens when what we're perhaps more familiar with in the Japanese landscape appears? Rice farming, uh, with the beginning of what is called the Yayoi period. I could talk about the origins of rice farming till the cows come home, but I won't. This is just a map to give you some indication of the complexity um, involved in academic dis discourse on this topic at the moment. But the long and the short of it is we know that sometime between about 900 BC and about 300 BC, rice farming appears in the Japanese archipelago and people start building paddy fields for themselves and it has a massive lifestyle change. Dogs seem to start to play a rather different role in this new farming economy. Um, here is a little, I thought this was quite cute. This is from Nishihara Odsuka in Saitama Prefecture up in the Kanto. And um, it's described as maybe a dog figurine or maybe a deer figurine. Who knows, what do you think? I'm not quite sure. We do know that dogs actually change their morphology a little bit and the skulls change shape a little bit. And um, there's a slight, slight foreshortening of the snout. And the Jomon dogs who have got relatively low foreheads um, give way to Yayoi dogs who have slightly higher uh, foreheads going on here. And the shift from hunting and gathering to rice farming, as I said, and a shift from dogs as hunting companions to dogs as de tasty delicacies. Now, how do we know that? How do we know that Yayoi people were tucking into doggy meat? Well, here at the Yayoi period site of Kame in uh, Osaka Prefecture, we've got a pit, uh, an assemblage of all kinds of different animal bones, including a number of dogs, two dogs here, which have been dismembered, uh, chopped up, and in a way reminiscent certainly of what you do if you were processing these animals for meat. And if you look closely at the bones, you can see cut marks 
um, on the bones, cut marks on the skulls here, cut marks on the jaws here, which suggests butchery or skinning. And if you've ever wondered how to skin your dog most effectively, um, this is how you do it. Maybe they were eating dogs, but dogs also play an important symbolic role in the Aoi culture, um, as do deer um, in particular. We know this from some rather wonderful bronze bells. Now, at the Aoi period, along with rice farming, metallurgy also comes into the Japanese archipelago. Metallurgy and indeed silk weaving uh, comes in at the same time, more or less. Um, and these are some lovely bronze bells. The one on the right um, is about just over 40 centimeters in height. And these are quite unusual. There's about 400 of these bronze bells known from up and down Japan, uh, sorry, up and down Western Japan, um, but very few of them, less than 10%, have actually got illustrations on them. And if you look carefully here, you can see all these people undertaking various activities. Um, so here we've got a couple of people pounding rice, looks like they're making mochi. Who, here we've got somebody in a boat uh, fishing. We've got some animals. We've got a crane by the looks of things. We've got uh, tortoises. We've got some water insects. But most interestingly, over here, we have a little scene. And this is a bell that was discovered in the Tokugawa period. So unfortunately, we don't have a lot of context for this bell. This is what these scenes look like. And it's this scene down here that's particularly interesting. This looks like a wild boar and it appears to be surrounded by some dogs and somebody with a bow and arrow. A little bit closer up here. So there's something about hunting continuing into this period when people are still are, have started growing rice. And we know from all kinds of studies that wild food resources continue to be important throughout Japanese uh, history, as indeed they are today. Any of you who enjoy Japanese food will know that sometimes it's those wild uh, resources that are particularly uh, delicious. Dogs, and this one, I again, I have a little bit of a question about. This is from the Hirano site in Osaka. This is a pottery shirt. Um, and what we've got on the left is a, is a Yayoi period warrior, because we know that um, people started fighting with each other. They're competing over land. Um, they're fighting with each other. He's got a shield going on here and possibly a dog associated with him. I would say this one could also be a deer, but there will be differences of opinion on that one. And I would be interested to know what you dog fans out there make of that. Um, these sort of stick figures on these Yayoi pots are quite common. And this, they are interpreted as being, sometimes they're warriors. This one seems to be a bird, got a very interesting shaped head, but this has got bird shaped wings. You can see the claws on the wings and there's a deer inside there. And these are interpreted as shamans or shamanesses, people who could commune with the spirit world, um, very often taking on the personality of animals to do that. This one is from Nara prefecture in the first century AD. So that's how yayoi farmers and eating dogs, maybe. The next period in Japanese archaeology is called the Kofun period. It's called the Kofun period because the word Kofun means old mound. And here are some old mounds, old burial mounds. Um, and um, the amazing thing about these Japanese mounds is there are, well, first of all, there's about 160,000 of them known from up and down Japan. And many of them are huge. In fact, this one, uh, the top right, is uh, the tomb of a, 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 um, a associated with uh, or attributed to the fifth century Emperor Nintoku, and it is the largest burial mound of the ancient world. It's bigger than the tomb of the first emperor of China. It's about 486 meters in length, and it would have taken millions and millions of man hours to construct. What we've got here are the burial mounds of the first rulers of a relatively unified Japanese state. Uh, and they're built um, from the 4th through to the eight, early 8th eight centuries AD. Uh, this is on the left here is one of the earliest ones, the Hashihaka tomb, which is possibly the burial mound of the first named queen of Japan that we know about, Queen Himiko of a country called Yamataiko, that we know about her from Chinese chronicles. Now, what you'll notice around these tombs, I'm not going to go into any of these about this, is we've got lots and lots of these terracotta figures. There are about 20,000 terracotta figures were set up around the uh, Nintoku tomb. Um, there are lots of different interpretations of this. One 
One idea, which is always quite fun to trot out, is that maybe they were replacements for human sacrifices. Because uh, in ancient China, of course, lots of people were sacrificed when a ruler was buried. Um, in Japan, they stopped doing that uh, and they replaced it with ceramic figures. And there are dogs in amongst these, uh, what we call Haniwa figures, terracotta tomb guardians. Um, and these dogs are possibly hunting dogs. Sorry, this one is actually the soft toy variety, uh, which you can purchase when you visit the National Museum of Japanese History when you're next uh, near Narita Airport. Um, these dogs um, seem to suggest that hunting was an elite activity by this stage, so that if you were being buried in one of those big tombs and you wanted to have the guardians around, perhaps reflecting what was going to be happening to you after you died, you would definitely want to make sure you've taken your loyal hunting dogs with you. Okay, and here's some more. Just a couple of dogs. This is more of these Haniwa figures. This is the famous one. You can see this one in the Tokyo National Museum, I believe. And here's a dog making its way up a cylindrical Haniwa figure um, with a monkey going on here. All sorts of things. Here's the dog just there. Some of these tombs are decorated inside. They're painted inside. And here's one that's particularly interesting from our doggy perspective. Uh, this is the Kyotose tomb um, in Gumma prefecture, where there's a big cluster of uh, these tombs, especially from the 6th, early 7th century. Um, and if you look very carefully, you can see there's a number of figures. Well, actually, let's make it easy for you. This is what it really looks like on the inside. And if you take a nice drawing, um, you can see that we've got a couple of characters with their baggy trousers, which we find on some of the Haniwa figures. We've got a deer, and then we've got Inu. Yes, yes, there it is. There's somebody's dog is uh, wandered into the scene. Maybe another dog here, or maybe that's another deer that the the dog is uh, keeping in in under control there. And all sorts of spirals and other fun things. So this is all about what's happening in the other world. Um, but dogs clearly are still an important part of that symbolism. Okay, coming forward into later times there is an assumption that because Japan was largely Buddhist, people didn't eat very much meat. Well, archaeology can turn that one on its head. Um, and here is an example. This is Kusado Sengencho um, in uh, Hiroshima Prefecture, this lovely river coming out into the Inland Sea. Um, this is just to the up the coast of the Inland Sea a little bit. It's near Fukuyama, um, and it is to the east of uh, the modern day city of Hiroshima. This is a medieval trading center in the middle of the river here, and it was excavated in the 1970s and 1980s. And if you go to the Hiroshima Prefectural Museum, again, there are fabulous dioramas where you can see uh, what this sort of trading entrepot would have looked like. And these are, it's a trans shipping sort of place. So there'll be little boats coming up and down the inland sea. They'll be getting off all their stuff. Here we've got, so we've got rice bales and things going on here, off the boats and onto another boat to continue its journey um, further along the coast. 14th to 17th centuries, medieval, lots of dismembered dog bones with those same cut marks that we saw in the Yayoi period. So they're eating those dogs. And we think that because you don't find that all the bones that belong to the dogs, maybe this is meat that's coming in on the bone um, and either for trade or being consumed um, on site. Really interesting site, and you can read more about it and other sites like this in a book that Simon Ray kindly plugged for in the beginning, hot off the press, the archaeology of medieval towns, case studies from Japan and Europe. If you're looking for a Christmas present, couldn't find a better one. Here we are now, onwards, away from the archaeology a little bit and into the realms of art history and the late medieval and into the Tokugawa shogunate. Um, and another change in dogs. Um, the Portuguese are the first Europeans to arrive in Japan, as we know, Tanegashima, 1485. And here we've got one of these lovely Nambambyobu, these, uh, these beautifully painted scrolls. And look what, the, look what the Portuguese are bringing with them. Elite dogs, probably much more bred than many of the Japanese dogs would have been up to that point. And it's only from here on in that dog ownership starts to become a common thing in Japan. Here's another one of these screens with another rather splendid pair of dogs being brought in by these curiously colorful figures from, uh, from the West. Just got a couple more minutes to go, just a few more slides to show you. I couldn't resist, this was my colleague, or actually a couple of people when I said to them, I'm giving a talk on dogs in archaeology, they said, you must talk about the dog Shogun, in that case, uh, Tokugawa Tsunayoshi. The born, of course, in the year of the dog, uh, 1646. Um, fifth Tokugawa Shogun, 
um, he entertained Engelbert Kempfer um, at the court. He was all behind screens, so we didn't actually get to see him, but uh, Kempfer knew about him. And of course, Kempfer leaves some of the best uh, records of Japan um, from this period, from the 17th century. But um, Tsuno Yoshi is particularly renowned for his compassion for living things. And um, 1695, um, there's a big problem in Edo, the capital, in that it's overrun with dogs and there's a terrible stench and dog poo all over, no good. So 50,000 dogs are removed to suburban kennels and fed on fish, note that fish thing again, and rice at the taxpayer's expense. What would a conservative government make of that? Okay, we know that these animals are now being kept as pets because we find their gravestones. And I just think these are amazing. Uh, we've got one from 1816, the spirit of a white haired dog. And we've got uh, one from 1766, uh, the tower or the, 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 the grave marker, if you like, of a wise cat. I think they're uh, two of my favorite objects from researching this talk. And it's perfect timing because just published in antiquity, the journal you should all read if you don't already, um, is this, do all dogs go to heaven? Tracking human animal relationships through archeological surveys of pet cemeteries. Now this is all happening in Britain, um, but um, it's, it's a really interesting study, as I say, literally just published, uh, 27th of October, how about that? Um, you know, the day before yesterday, amazing. Uh, here we are, here, this wonderful survey of um, attitudes to pets through the ages. And uh, I would highly recommend any of you interested in such things to dip into that. End of the Meiji period, and we find that dogs are represented a little tiny bit in Japanese mythology. And of course, there's a great reinvention of Japanese mythology and Japanese tradition in the Meiji period. And here we've got the Mitsumi, Mitsumine Shrine in Saitama, uh, where we've got these are actually, wolf, I think they're wolves rather than dogs, um, but they're the, uh, they're the Orkami. Um, and of course, most shrines that you go to, you'll see um, the fox gods, or the Inari shrine, or you might even see the, the lion dogs, uh, which aren't dogs at all, but they're more like dragons, um, which are associated for, which draw a lot of Chinese mythology. But these are the rare examples of canines being represented in Japanese uh, folklore and traditional religion. Now, I'm just going to end by putting this in a little tiny bit of context for you um, and a couple of really interesting discoveries. One is from much closer to home, Stonehenge, this dog tooth. Uh, this owner of this dog tooth was clearly into long dog walks because the dog tooth comes from Yorkshire and we think the whole dog possibly made its way from Yorkshire with its owner all the way down to Stonehenge, maybe for a nice prehistoric uh, festival. We've got in Siberia, we've got uh, 9,000 year old sled dogs. And here they are, the different types of fossils. These are, these are the direct ancestors, if you like, of this wonderful wolf who's right behind me. Um, but we know that for that long, these dogs have been used and are very important um, for transportation as well, obviously, as for hunting and for food and for elite prestige. We know that from various parts of the world, we've got lovely depictions of dogs for in rock art. And this is one of the earliest examples, again, relatively recently discovered from Saudi Arabia, two sites um, where a number of uh, dogs look like hunting dogs. Um, and it's thought that these rock carvings are about 8,000 years old. So probably about the same date as our two dog burials from Kamikuroiwa rock shelter, where we started this adventure. If you go to Scandinavia and if you go to Tanum, a lovely World Heritage Site, you can see depictions of dogs in the rock art there. Uh, around about 3,000, this, this would be equivalent to the later part of the Jomon period. So maybe about the same date as those dog dogu um, that we saw a little while ago. So we know basically that dogs, canids have been appearing in art from around the world for a long time. Here's perhaps on the right is perhaps the oldest example probably a wolf rather than a dog, we think, from Fond de Gome in France, uh, down in the Dordogne, sometime between 17 and 12,000 years ago, paintings on cave walls. And they appear in Roman mosaics, of course, as well. Dog poo. This is surely the bane of any dog owner's life. But archaeologically speaking, this stuff is gold dust um, and um, is all sorts of interesting studies. This is from a Chinese Neolithic village. Uh, so again, dates the same period as the Jomon period, 
and you can analyze this poo until you the cows come home because it will tell you all sorts of interesting things about what those dogs have been eating and the lifestyles they've been undertaking. Just lastly, I wanted to show you, I said the dogs will go, they go from being hunting companions through to being eaten through to elite pets. And here we have dogs as archeologists themselves. So I'm just gonna zip through some of these because they've got awful puns about dogs. I couldn't resist Indiana Bones, I thought was the best one. These are dogs that are being used on archeological sites. And here is Indy Jones himself, who is a dog for well-being for archaeologists to make them feel better on archaeological excavations and just to show how very important they are on those excavations here we've got a dog called Bryn who just passed away and if you visit the website of the Nessa Brodgar you can find a 3D model of Bryn um, who sadly expired last year I believe. He was the site director's dog but was widely regarded as the main director of the excavation. I'm going to pass over these. A little bit of inspiration for you, There's you can come back have a look at these this will find where you can find out more about the archaeology of dogs. Go to the British Museum, see the wonderful Japanese archaeological collections there when the galleries reopen. Uh, I did promise Kazmor that I'll talk about Go Walkies. And if you check out that website, this is an amazing way of getting dogs uh, or dog puppets involved in getting you more interested in what you're looking at in museums. And just to finish off some final amazing dog facts, and maybe we'll leave that there, we'll come back to that, because I just need to say there's a bibliography of anybody who's interested. And thank you to everybody who helped me put all this together. But maybe we'll go back to the amazing dog facts for you, which take me back to our sustainable development goals. Um, it's the amount of fish that get fed to dogs on an annual basis these days that I found most surprising. And doggy carbon footprints as well are astonishing things to think about um, in the broader realm of dog-human relationships. Simon, thank you very much indeed. No, thank you. No, I'm, I, 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 I've, I've appeared here, no, 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 no intention to, 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 to make you finish it at all. If you would if you'd like to, to speak about about this 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 particular to, to slide in in more detail, no, we, I think that's fine. It's we just do uh, have some questions coming through, but um, I would encourage people if you do have a question, please do put them through the question and answer function on your screen. Um, you you were talking about these uh, these uh, sustainable goals. Uh, could you just maybe go through that again on, on, on this one here about the, the, the carbon footprint equivalent and, and, and the like? Yeah, this is all taken from this extraordinary paper by um, Naomi Sykes and her colleagues. And uh, the title of the paper, if I've got it right here, was uh, the title page. Anyway, it's all about, um, it's all about how understanding uh, human relations with dogs. And here we are. Humanity's best friend, a dog centric approach to addressing global challenges. And um, the United Nations, back in 2015, I think, um, agreed the 17 sustainable development goals um, to take us through to 2030, I believe. Uh, if I haven't got that wrong. I may have got the dates a bit wrong. Um, and the idea is that it, it's all about. Um, alleviating environmental impacts. It's about alleviating poverty. Um, it's looking to the future. It's the things as humanity, as a sort of shared humanity, how can we make the world a better place instead of destroying it by 2030, I suppose. Um, and a lot of it is just about understanding things like what are our carbon footprints? Um, what about the amount of food um, that gets consumed? What about the amount of food that gets wasted, for example? Um, how much and we so the, the, it just raises a number of really interesting questions about you know around the world how much food gets fed to cats and dogs and would you be able to alleviate human uh, food poverty using that food I just thought it was very from an archaeological perspective I thought that's actually really really interesting especially given the notion that dog food was only created in the 1860s which was a new one on me I hadn't realized that I thought and that says so actually before that dogs, because obviously dogs have been sharing uh, their lives with human beings for nearly 20,000 years, but they've been eating the same stuff as humans, probably. Uh, fish and rice, if they were lucky enough to be in one of those kennels that uh, the dog shogun established. Um, and we know there's been some interesting studies that, again, I, I wasn't aware of until very recently, um, that wolves, we talk about, you know, this is a high protein diet that we all eating because it's good to be eating a hunter gatherer diet. But because life changes and human beings evolve, actually, that may not be quite as uh, straightforward as that. And it's true for dogs as well. Um, people say you shouldn't feed dogs on grains, but apparently, 
it doesn't do them any damage and it can be as good because they are leading very different lives to their to their wolfish ancestors as well so they don't only need to eat meat there's other things they can be consuming so I, I just thought wow there's a whole world here of interesting things and i thought the sustainable development goals is something that i think it's worth everybody being aware of um and every country every member of the united nations has signed up to them but uh, very few people out there i think can probably tell you what all 17 are i can't Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. And, and we're looking at them as well. So it's uh, it's very pertinent, very pertinent indeed. Thank you very much indeed. We have a few questions that have come through. If you if you have if you have time for us, I I, I just want to make one one comment from you showed a right at the very beginning a, a dog in a bath. You go to Kagoshima, you can have a tsunamushi onsen for for dogs. Oh, you can. There is one. Excellent. There is. You can for your pets. You can you can bury your 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 dog half in hot sand and uh, <laughs> the beauty treatment. Good, good. Uh, you also mentioned the, the bibliography, which um, you have here as well. I just want to mention that, um, Simon, thank you so much that you're sharing this, this bibliography with us. I should also thank the staff at Japan House London. So during this talk, we've managed to upload it uh, on um, so that people can access it. And it will be made available, the link will be made available through the chat for everybody who is taking part here as well. So thank you very much for that, Simon. Oh, no, that's fabulous because I couldn't, you know, this is not my research that I've been presenting. This is all other people's research. And so I've just sort of pulled it together in an incredibly, uh, in an incredibly sort of arrogant, light, light touch kind of way. But there's people who have dedicated their entire careers to these things. And uh, I think it's always very important to acknowledge all that important work that goes on. Oh, thank you very much indeed. How, how difficult was it actually? I mean, is, is, is there a wealth of a wealth of uh, literature out there on, on in dogs? Uh, the... I tell you, I had to do a huge amount of paring down. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> one of my favorite for anybody that's interested in, in, if you read Japanese, this one here, Uchiyama Sachiko on the archaeology of dogs, Inu no Kokoraku, fantastic and really nicely written. And the other one that I thought was a lot of fun, actually, is this one. Uh, there's some really interesting observations in this one by Brandy Betka and uh, Amanda Burt. Uh, it's a sort of a series of essays on dogs beyond, and archaeology beyond domestication. Well worth, well worth dipping into. Thank you very much indeed. So that, that's made available for everybody um, in, in the chat so that they're, if, if everything's taken your interest here. We have one question here. Um, uh, Dogs in Jomon and, Yay and the Yayoi periods were domesticated enough and were valuable hunting companions, but is there any trace suggesting that some were kept as pets at some point before modern times? Mm. Really, I want to know what they were called, because I guess if you've got two very valuable, if you're going to all the trouble of burying your dogs um, and sort of, so affording them um, the same burial that you would give to one of your family members when they've died, I bet you've given them a name. And I'd love to know what those Jomon names might have been for their dogs. We don't know. We just don't know. Um, but um, in terms of pets, I mean, I guess sort of, I think it's how you define these things, isn't it really? Um, because our, some, some working dogs are become very valued members of the household. So perhaps even more than pets, they actually become a part of a member of the a member of the family uh, you know sort of pets always see that whole word so it'll be interesting to look into the etymology of that um sort of suggests that they're you know they're entirely dependent um and they're just there to give pleasure um but um maybe you know these animals may well have had a whole set of different roles in the family that we just don't know about and again in in this in humanity's best friend this paper that i keep going back to the well-being aspect of animals is really interesting and the, the sort of the, the figures they're able to pull out on demonstrating you know how much better kids do and all the development and uh, if they've had pets if they've grown up around animals or if you've, if you've got old, older people with animals it sort of can help stave off dementia and all, all kinds of things there's there's a, a it's a very multifaceted um set of ideas in there so i don't know whether we could actually say jormon petto but uh, who knows thank you very much we have another question here from corinne that's come in do do the ancient dog remains appear to be similar breeds to the modern shiba and akita types mm -hmm. yeah that's a really good question and i know that chart that i didn't actually come across the number of different dog breeds that there are today 
pick up from the literature is that actually what we recognize as many of these breeds, um, that, that sort of notion of, of breeding dogs really only starts in the 18th and 19th centuries. And it's something that comes in from, well, it's, a, kind of, it's one of those European things. So those dogs that the Portuguese are bringing with them, you know, they look like very sort of elegant. They've been, they've been specially bred probably. Um, but, and so the, the fit, I think the, my, my, what I've understood from what I've been looking at is that actually, yeah, the, 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 Akita and the Chiba, they are, they're sort of, they're quite genetically quite close. There's quite a lot of DNA work done on dogs to try and work out, you know, sort of who's related to who in what ways. But all the examples that I was showing you, I think probably did look, and uh, sort of reading through, through the reports on it, did look certainly comparable to what those, to what the modern Japanese breeds would have, would have been like. And I mean, of course, they'd, they'd been bred over the last couple of hundred years to sort of to draw out those very distinctive characteristics that the individual breeds have. So it would have probably have just been maybe a more generic kind of Jomon 57 varieties much, I suppose, than uh, than any of the sort of things that we're perhaps more used to seeing being walked by uh, by dog walkers around fashionable suburbs of Tokyo these days. We had a we had an event uh, at Japan House, our first re since 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 March, a physical event with with their their various Japanese dog breeds, and the, the two, the Akita and the Shiba, were described as as primitive breeds. Uh, they're close it, close to yeah. their, their their ancestors, their wolf ancestors. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have another question here from from uh, Gianfranco. Um, what traits of the relationship of inhabitants of the Japanese islands? What traits have stayed the same and what traits have changed today? What, how the inhabitants and dogs, what, how the relationship may have changed, do you think? That's a very interesting question. It's a hard one to answer. Um, the traits, I, I'm, I'm, I'll sort of just take a, a, bit of a, a bit of a take on that, but I'm guessing that, um, okay, some things that will have stayed the same is dogs still bark, although Japanese dogs are suspiciously quiet. One wonders what's put in Japanese dog food. I must admit, it's always amazes me about how quiet Tokyo. You don't hear barking dogs. Um, in um, it's one of the papers I read, and it's one of those ones on the bibliography. They talk about the different stages through which you go from being feral um, to this sort of notion of semi-domesticated or like street dogs. And um, I was reading um, what's the name uh, Scabalan's really wonderful volume on the. Empire of Dogs, which is one that I'd also highly recommend, especially if you're interested in this kind of 19th century, the way in which dogs get involved in, in the definition of national identities and things like that. Um, and um, he's, he's sort of talking about the ways in which um, these dogs, um, the street dogs, um, get sort of the, the language that's used for street dogs, gets all tied up in the language of sort of generic colonial um, prejudice as well and uh, prejudice about other types of peoples has some really interesting things in there I think and then it comes through to you know the pets the dogs that are now sort of live very closely there's a symbiosis with humans I suppose so one could if one's setting it in that sort of that longer term um, evolutionary history of, of what dogs as, as as pets looks like then then that they might be some of the things that have changed over time. Okay thank you very much I think maybe we've got Time for just one more question. Um, this is an interesting one from, from Christopher. Um, what might a future archaeology of dogs in Japan look like? Wow. Well, now then, um, you see this creature behind me, which uh, 40,000 years old, brain still in place. Um, it's Japanese, Japanese and Korean scientists actually, who are doing some really interesting work with um, thinking about whether you can bring back any of these ancient animals from the past. Now, using the, the genetic material that we've got, it would be like, um, what's that wonderful character in Carry On Screaming, Oddbod. It would be the sort of the Oddbod of the dog world. There we are, that's what I'd like to see in a future archeology span of, uh, of dogs of Japan. Can we bring back uh, one of the 50,000 50, dogs that the dog shogun uh, sent off to the kennels and see if they really enjoy the experience or not. Thank you very much indeed. We still have more questions, but we don't have any more time, I'm afraid. Hello. Um, and lots of questions about dogs, um, um, rather than archaeology as well. <laughs> 
thank you very much everybody for for submitting your question i'm sorry if we haven't been able to to get through to them um but thank you very much simon um what what a joy to to, to have you talk about the archaeology of dogs at the whim of japan house and uh, an exhibition about archaeology of dogs I, I i erroneously said that this wouldn't necessarily be about um architecture for dogs but you did mention dog houses earlier on in 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 your talk so thank you so much indeed um i can see that many people have also uh, have have contributed as well maybe through uh, chats with you about <laughs> this particular subject but thank you so much it's uh, it's it's been brilliant um before we disappear, um, I just like to remind people that the bibliography, of course, that Simon has uh, has, has has provided for us uh, is is been sent the link to it in the chat. Um, some Japan House events that are, are are happening. Of course, we have our Architecture for Dogs exhibition, which runs until the tenth of January, here at uh, Japan House. We have an interactive display as well. If you want to bring your dog along, you can bring it to Japan House and interact with some of the uh, installations. We have the Architecture for Dogs Roadshow, which uh, goes to some areas in, in London. Uh, we've been to the Horniman Museum and we are going to the Architectural Association on Bedford Square next week. Uh, this is also where you will see a playground for non-humans um, a collaborative uh, event with the AA, the Architectural Association, including a series of new works created by members and friends of the Architectural Association. That's a playground for non-humans. We have a conversation uh, with Asif Khan and Hara Kenya on the 6th of November. Uh, that should be very interesting. Asif Khan is the latest contributor to the Architecture of, for Dogs exhibition at Japan House London. Uh, we're looking forward to that very much indeed. And lastly, uh, to introduce our JAXA series, JAXA being the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. We're doing a series of talks and presentations with them. Part one is searching for the origins of the universe on Wednesday, the 18th of November with our colleagues in Japan from JAXA. Uh, Simon, thank you so much it's been an absolute pleasure um so glad that we could uh, we could do something with you as well at this time thank you very much indeed for looking especially into the archaeology of dogs for us for this particular. thank you thank you very much to everybody who has uh listened and watched today as well um i hope everybody stays safe um we still can't travel yet um, maybe next time, Simon, we can do something in person with you as well. Be lovely, wouldn't it? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, stay safe and um, we'll join you again soon. Bye bye. Thanks very much.